I'm here with Luong Ung, the author of First They Killed My Father. It's been made into a movie coming out September 15th on Netflix. Very good to have you with us this morning. Great to be here. Thank you. So let's start with your story. Before we get to the film itself, your story in the book, First They Killed My Father, I want to start with a, a particular date, April 17th, 1975. Leading up to that date, what was your life like in Phnom Penh? I, relatively normal. I grew up with um, in a, fam a big family with the three brothers and three sisters and both my parents and went to school six days a week, um, three times a day, studying Chinese, Cambodian, French, and then for the boys um, and, um, and English for the girls. Um, and on Saturdays and, and sometimes in a Sunday off, we would go to picnics as, with the whole family or the movie theaters right across the street. And so I think it was relatively normal and very, very happy. And what changed on April 17th, 1975? April 17th was when the Khmer Rouge soldiers stormed into the country. There had been a civil war in the country all through you know, many, many years. We just didn't know about it because we lived in a city and we were very sheltered. And so we knew there were occasional bombings of movie theaters near us or occasional um, riots near um, at the markets near us. But my parents were so protective of us that we weren't allowed in these areas as many parents would do and so we were kept safe in shelter and on that day I remember just um, being on the street with my sisters and playing hopscotch when the rows of black of the uh, road of trucks came in army trucks and there were men and, and some women in black shirts and pants and wearing really big smiles um, and um, and also grenades on their belts and guns on their backs. And then they were screaming that the war was over, the war was over. And that was the day the country fell when the Khmer Rouge soldiers took over the country. That is a day that changed your life too. So as we understand, the Khmer Rouge was a brutal regime. And if you had any education, you were killed. 1.7 million Cambodians died of a population of about 7 million. Yeah. Uh, what did, in the immediate aftermath of that, how did your family survive? Well, we were, um, our families, along with all the other families in other cities in Cambodia, were immediately evacuated from the cities. And we were told to pack as little as we could, pots and pans, a little bit of rice, some clothes, um, and then to leave everything behind and to leave the city and to go into the countryside. Because they said the Americans were coming in and were going to bomb the city and we didn't leave, we would all be killed. And so well, that was the first lie they told. Um, we were not able to go home after that. For the next three years, eight months, and 20 days, all of Cambodia would become a prison and all the people would live in villages that were akin to mass labor camps where um, every day we work, woke up at dawn and then worked all day growing food and digging trenches and building dams to support a regime we didn't know anything about. And in a span of almost four years, again, 1.7 to 2 million Cambodians died out of a population of 7 million people. Um, so it was very, very brutal. Your father had been uh, an educated man, a, a high up military official, uh, government official there. But he also then became, as the rest of you, a laborer. Yes, yes. There was a day when, and this is, this is the title of the book, First They Killed My Father. There was a day when they came for your dad and he walked away. And you talk about in the book about how you didn't think about when he would come home. You thought something else at that point. Yeah. This was a year and <clears throat> a year and you know change into the regime and we didn't know what was going on and this was in a place where things were happening around us but nobody told us what happened there was no idea stream there was no newspapers and radios and and people giving us information so that we could prepare ourselves but we did realize that people were missing people were starting to disappear in the middle of the night at first and then during the daytime and then during dinner times and that other fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters were just disappeared um, because the soldiers would come and they would be gone and no one would talk about them. And so we knew something bad was happening. And, and then it did not take a lot of imagination to, to, to b believe and to know what kind of bad things were happening. Um, and so for me, when my father was taken by the two soldiers and as he walked off into the sunset, it was a gorgeous, glorious night. And literally, I, I believe at that age that the gods had painted the sky, this palette of magenta and gold and pink and stardust. And yet in my heart, I only felt fear. I only felt hate. I only felt hurt. And I could not imagine how there could be any beauty in the world because I knew my father was taken to be killed. 
I just knew that I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Um, and as now, to date, I've gone back to Cambodia over 35 trips. And in a country the size of the state of Oklahoma, it's today littered with over 20,000 masquerades. Mm -hmm. And so many other parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters and, and have been discovered. But to this day, I do not know what happened to my father. You lost your father and your mother and two sisters during yes. that time. Uh, the movie will recount all of these parts of your life. I've seen the trailer. There's also the young Luang Ung training to be a soldier. That was something too that you were forced to do? That was something that happened to me and many other children and in Cambodia and also in other, in other states where there are wars. Um, you know, they, they target the most vulnerable and the most scared of the population. And after my father and mother was taken from me and after I've seen so much death and destructions and horrors and suffering, um, I was alone. I didn't have any, anybody to protect me. And so they sent me from um, one camp to another until I arrived at a child soldier's training camp. And I use these words because for a lack of, of better ways to describe them to Americans than Western audiences. But it wasn't a camp like other camps. We were living together, all these small children, and we were told we were special children because we had a strength or a rage or an anger about us that, that they believe was trainable. And um, when other children in the world were learning to read and write, we were also put in classes where our supervisors were telling us propaganda stories and information about who wanted us dead and who wanted us killed and who were spies in our community who would hurt us. Um, and when other children around the world were playing balls and, 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 track and, and running track and field, we were given guns, a half our body's height, a third our body's weight, and were taught to shoot and killed because again, people wanted to harm us. And in order for us to live and protect ourselves and each other, we had to learn to hurt. Um, and so for a better part of a year, I was trained with this kind of hate mentality and hurt physicality. How old are you at this time? I was eight going on nine. Wow. At 10, you finally escape. Yes. And you recount that in the book, and then it leads to your next book, Lucky Child. And we can get into some of that, too, because I'm interested if the movie covers any of that, the film covers any of that. But at 10, your older brother, Meng, arranges for an escape by boat to Thailand. He has a wife. He has room for one more. You and your sister, Chu, are standing there. She's 12. He picks you. That had to be perhaps the greatest moment and maybe one of the worst moments of your life at the same time. Tell me a little bit about how that felt. My sister Ju is actually here and for the very first time in America, yes, in Cleveland, visiting me for the very, very first time in the many years we've been separated. So um, it was really, really, uh, like you said, the most joyful moment because my child's heart just grab on to the dream that with this trip, I could remake myself. I could have a better future. I could find safety. I could build a better life. As long as we get to that place where there is school, where there are working governments, where there is no war, where we could be safe. And yet to grab onto this dream and this opportunity, I also knew I had to leave my siblings and especially my sister, who was not just a sister, but a kindred spirit and a best friend. And we shared everything together when we were children because there were again, seven of us. And with me being five when the war started and her being seven, we were always have always, we're always and we'll have always been and we'll always be the closest siblings. And I had to leave her behind, not knowing if I would see her again, if, when we leave her, the war would come back and reclaim and take her lives, uh, her life, or if I would ever make, the sa make it to safety and we would ever reunite with each other again. So when, when I was chosen, I knew it was a bittersweet moment that you know there was all this joy, but there was all, also the sadness of not knowing when I would ever see my sister again and if she would be alive for me to find her after I left her. You ended up through humanitarian religious group going to Vermont and having a, a life there, one that she probably couldn't have imagined because it was also kind of rural. She might have thought you were in the middle of some American skyscraper scene and you weren't. 15 years later, you finally were able to reconnect. And as you mentioned, you've been back to Cambodia more than 35 times. Uh, what was that like reconnecting and seeing 
how her life progressed and yours too. And, and that again is the subject of, of your next book, Lucky yes. Child. Yeah. And in Lucky Child, what I wanted to write about was what it took to survive the peacetime long after everybody, the journalists and presidents and newspapers and people told you that the war is over. Whether you stay behind and you're fighting the war physically on the land or uh, also emotionally, or whether you leave it and go to another country and you're fighting the war psychologically and traumatically in your heart and in your mind. And so, um, and I wanted to explore that, but mostly I wanted to write about my sister. I wanted to write about my best friend. And um, I went to Cambodia for the very first time and I was 25 years old and I was on the way to the UN Conference on Women in China. So I was felt very empowered. I've studied abroad. I've gotten my college degree here. I studied political science. And so, um, and I just felt really privileged and blessed. And so when I landed in Cambodia, um, the nights before I land, actually before I got the, on a plane, I kept getting, and, and having these reoccurring dreams of getting on a plane, feeling powerful, feeling empowered, and then getting off the plane. And I am, once again, a tiny little girl, reaching for hands to hold on to, to grab in the crowds and seas of people all around me and couldn't find one. And so my hands just felt really empty. And um, when I got off the plane and went through immigration and there were my family members, 20 or 25 of them standing body to body, looking at me as I came out. And everybody, we were just had this moment where it was happiness, but fear and anxiety and nervousness. And we were looking at each other and not knowing what to say. Um, and my cousin, one of my cousin looked at me and said, you look like a Khmer Rouge. And it was because I had been traveling by myself. So I had on my stain resistant brown shirts and brown pants and Tiva sandals and scarves and backpacks. And so to them, it looked like the Khmer Rouge soldiers outfits. My sister immediately ran over to me, grabbed my hands, and that was it. That was all that's needed. And we were sisters again ever since. Um, it was as if our, our bonds never broke. Wow. The movie, let's talk a little bit about that. Well, first I'd like to know, how did you become a Clevelander? So you moved to <laughs> Vermont, you grow up there, you go to school there, and now we know you as a, a human rights activist and author and business mogul mm -hmm. from Shaker Heights. So how did, how did that happen? Well, I know Cleveland is such a great town. I truly love Cleveland. I moved here from Washington, D.C. after staying there for seven years. And um, I met my husband, who was born and raised in Shaker Heights at college when we were 19. And we had a long 10-year dis long-distance relationship. And when we married, I moved here. Um, you know, Cleveland's a great town. Everybody, I think many people moved here because for work, you know, the Cleveland clinics and we have world-class museum and arts and cultures and vibrancies and, muse and, and theater venues that I could go and we could all go for a fraction of the price of what you would pay for in New York, DC, Paris. Um, and, um, but I moved here for love. I moved here for love. I visited often for fun, but I moved here for love. And now, now I'm really, really happy to be a Clevelander. And my husband and I, Mark and Sam McNulty and Andy Tavikim and, um, and Mike Foran, we are in the restaurant and brewery business together. On, um, we have a, three restaurants and a production facility, a, a, production, a brewery production in um, o Ohio Garden, City. Right? Market Garden Brewery, Barcento, Beer Market. Yeah, we're actually having a lot of fun. Let's talk about the movie. Was that a lot of fun? I, how, first of all, how did it happen? I mean, you wrote the book in 2000. It's a bestseller. We've talked to you about it. People across the world know about this. Did Angelina Jolie just happen to pick the book up and read it? <laughs> yeah. She was filming Tomb Raiders in Cambodia in 2001 or 2000. And my book had just come out in 2000 of April. And uh, because of her being in Cambodia, she picked up the book and, um, and then called me up. And, and that was back in 2000 or 2001, and, um, and we've become friends and, and uh, ever since. She, she's someone who's very well known, so few people know about our friendship, but we've been friends for 16, 17 years now. And, um, and we've talked a bit through the years about making a film out of the book, and I, my answer has always been, if it was ever gonna be done, it was gonna be done with the right team, the right person, someone with great integrity and intention and care, not for just Cambodia, but also the state of our world. Somebody who I trust, because this isn't just a story that I would give to anybody. I needed to work with people I know and trust to honor my family story and also honor Cambodia history and culture. 
Um, and uh, then she started directing herself and she did a couple of movies, Unbroken being, being the last one she did, and, and then um, By the Sea. And, uh, and then she just felt like she wanted to do it. She has an adopted Cambodian son, Maddox, who just turned 16 this year, and he also wanted to get more involved and learn more about his, his birth country. And it became a very family project. So two years ago, we all, you know, she and I wrote and adapted the screenplay from my book. Maddox is an in in executive producer, and we were all in Cambodia, in Cambodia making this film and um, for about four to five months. What surprised you most about the filmmaking process? Um, the filmmaking process is a wonderful collaboration. I love that about film. I watch a lot of films and I visited Angelina through the years at, um, on movie sets. But most of the time, our friendships is just very, very normal. We, we meet up, we hang out, we eat, <laughs> you know, right. which is great. But it's also, you know, and when, I, and when you write, I'm an avid reader and I love to write, and um, it's a solitary pr job profession. You just sit, it's you and a computer and you type and type. And, and uh, you're going through many things and many emotions by yourself. And sometimes that actually can be very painful. And for me, writing about some of the saddest part of my experience and then having no hands to hold and no one to reach out to and I'm experiencing this alone. On a movie set, we worked with um, approximately, I think at the end of it all, maybe 21,000, 20,000 extra and background actors. And so you're working with hundreds and thousands of people each day. And especially when you're making the film in Cambodia, it was shot entirely in Cambodia, in the Khmer language, and with entire, entire um, Khmer cast, mm. and uh, many, in most Khmer crew. And a lot of the Cambodians there have either experienced the war themselves, or were children of survivors of the genocide. And so everybody on the set knew something of the experience. And I think as a, uh, as a result of that, our healing process was amplified because we were able to discuss it together. We were able to be there together. And when somebody had a difficult moment, we could be there and reach out and give them a hug or go and burn incense and candles together. Um, and I think as a result of that was a very healing experience for many of us. You talked about the crew being local. Yeah. Uh, how, how, um, how was that experience working with the Cambodian government, working with people? There's also been some criticism that some of the extras were Cambodian army folks and the Human Rights Watch and others said that should have been a no-no. So there's also been a lot of that involved in it. What do you make of that and how was that experience? Well, I'm not in the boot movie business, so I was there as I worked a lot with the cast. No, no, I think the government was very respectful. The government wanted the, con the, the movie to be authentic. And when, when the people, whoever came into our movie set, they took off whatever clothes they wore before and they were civilians when they were on the movie set. You know, I was, and I'm a Clevelander, but when I went to oh, Cambodia, I became a worker in, on the set. And so <laughs> I think, you know, for, we, we were very, very careful. Every people were taken care of, the land was swept. <laughs> sorry, of landmines, and the children were very well taken care of. We had therapists, we had monks, we had spirit house. So I think um, the production crew did everything possible they could to make it a, an experience that was healing um, for everybody on the set. The movie was finished and then it premiered in Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, I think it was in February. Can you tell me about that experience of sitting in a theater and watching, the, watching your life unfold on the screen? That was probably the most anxious, nervous night I had the night before the film showed. And um, we were, we premiere in Angkor Wat, this most beautiful temple complex. And um, it's the largest religious complex in the world built by um, the Khmer people um, over a thousand years ago. And so we set it, you know, the Netflix set up big screens and we invited the dignitaries and the king and the queen attended and, um, and also a lot of NGOs. And for me, I had 33 members of my family, um, relatives, brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. And I was a wreck. <laughs> I could not <laughs> breathe. I could not sleep. I also was in my Hollywood clothes where I had makeup and hair and my dress was, probably too tight and so I couldn't breathe um, and I was so nervous. I was, I care deeply how the film is done. I care deeply that hope people will like it all the world. But I really, really, really wanted my family 
to feel honored and to, be, to know that this is a love let letter to our family and to the country and to the culture. And I wanted them to, to think that I got it right. Um, and so I sat with my family members and from the very moment the film started, they were just in silent and then they laughed and then they cried and then they gasped. And then at the end of it, they, they were just, they loved the film. And, 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 um, and so many other Cambodians um, through the consequent screenings would come up to me and said they loved the film. And so now I feel like I can breathe. Whatever happens from now on, from here on, I'm okay because my family and the Cambodians really love the film. It's out September 15th on Netflix. Tell me where it stops in your life. Is it when you, when you made the trip to the United States? Is that the, essentially the end of the film, or am I giving it, are we giving away too much? <laughs> no. um, it stops when the siblings are, after the war, after the, the Vietnamese came into the country, and um, my siblings and I were reunited. So maybe there's a sequel? I don't know. <laughs> it's it's strange having having your life being made into a film is a strange experience. Um, writers write, and my theory is that many writers write because they don't have to be in contact with so many people. <laughs> you know, so it's it's exhilarating. But I I like I like writing. Um, if people show interest, maybe I I will let someone else make it. But I'm not sure I want to be involved. Luang Ong, thanks so much for being with us. The film is out September 15th on Netflix. It's called First They Killed My Father. Very good to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.